Now I'm just saying, you want to get a group of people really riled up, you want to put this on your church sign. <laughs> because I have to tell you, out of the 18 years I've been at Cornerstone United Methodist Church, we have received more calls about that sign than any other. I didn't get any calls during Ash Wednesday a couple years ago when I put on the sign, Get Your Ash in Church. <laughs> But for some reason, Keith Herod and Christmas is causing quite the controversy. I mean, people driving by, people calling Kathy in the office. How dare you put Keith Herod and Christmas on your sign? I even had to give Kathy a little script, like a little sentence answer that she could respond because she's like, these people are calling, I don't know what to say. So she's like, I don't even know why we keep Herod and Christmas anyway. You did this to me. I mean, we have people driving up, actually stop and get out of the car, talk to David Etzel. What's this about this Herodian Christmas thing? I mean, is this a whacked out weird church? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Hmm. It's also a really honest church, I think. I think we're called to a certain level of transparency. That's why I shared with you that I'm kind of in a black place. But I'm rising out of it. I mean, we're human beings, right? We all wrestle, we all struggle with things, we have to deal with issues. Life is going on all around us, and we find ourselves in the midst of its reality. And guess what? Sometimes we find ourselves in the midst of its reality, and it's not always good. Now, this sermon today, which is entitled, For the Children, in your bulletin, which is the sermon title I gave, is directly connected with that statement about keeping Herod in Christmas as well. It is important for us to spend a moment today talking about it. So what does that mean for us? Keeping Herod in Christmas. Hmm. Anybody else have any issues with that sign? To be honest with you. Yeah? I mean, there are people that drove by. I mean, I, even David has to go back here. David say, everybody say, hey, David. Hey, David. Hey, David. Hey, David. On Wednesday, when we gathered for our discussion group, he came in and he said, I drove by the sign, and I kind of went, ooh. <laughs> and I'll be honest, it kind of got on there by accident, because what we've been doing is we've been putting the title of the chapters from Brian's books on the sign, and Dominique is doing that, and she put it up there. I didn't even know it was up there until somebody said, did you know there's Keith Herring and Christmas on your sign? And I did go, ooh. <laughs> Because I knew that it was going to cause so much. People are going to have questions. And you know what? That's good. Because if somebody went home and they're at the dinner table and said, Can they, you believe that church cornerstone, but keep Harry to Christmas? And then a whole conversation erupts around that. Because what we want the Christmas story to be is Disney World, don't we? We want it to be magic and fairies. And, you know, when I go to Disney World, it's escapism, it's not real. But I feel really good when I'm there because the rocks are singing to me. <laughs> you know, they even have fake birds in the woods. You're wondering, now, there are birds everywhere. And Leslie's like, where are the birds? I'm like, I don't know. And then you look down, it's coming out of a rock. <laughs> it's a magical place. I have nothing wrong. I like going to Disney World. But when I leave Disney World and I get the bill, <laughs> reality sets in. <laughs> We want to turn the Christmas story into Disney World. We want it just to be magical, and, and, and really we want it to represent and embody everything we want, which is we want peace, and we want a moment to get away from all the troubles of the world. But my brothers and sisters, we are not at Christmas yet. We are still in the season of Advent, and we are being reminded during this season that there are still things we need to wrestle with in the midst of the world things that we need to confront. Because the beauty of the Christmas story is that God comes to be with us in the midst of our reality. And God is not afraid to confront the principalities and the powers of the world. In other words, God finds God's self, a baby in a manger, in the midst of our brokenness and our pain and our violence and our power and our corruption and our darkness. You can't keep Herod out of the Christmas story. It's part of the story. You heard it today, didn't you? Yes. Jesus is born, comes into the world, Emmanuel, God with us. And Herod, the king, well, he wants it, doesn't he? 
And he doesn't want to go pay homage. What does he want to do? He wants him dead. Because everything Herod is about represents and symbolizes the systems that are broken. Herod is an embodiment of the powers and the principalities of the world. That's what the Apostle Paul calls the dark places, the evil places. And it's not just our own personal sin that we battle with the broken sin that he's talking about. He's talking about the systems in the world that lead to destruction, separation, division, and conquest. And invite us to participate in our consumerist ideas that we want more and more and more and give us more and more and more. And those systems are hard to maintain without some form of control. And most of the time, the form of control that those systems embody are forms of violence towards one another. War is hell, amen? <laughs> Literally, war is hell. And many people around the world are caught up in the, the throes of the violent system. Herod embodies that. And God is not afraid to confront those realities. As a matter of fact, God is born right in the midst of it. God comes in the midst of it. That's good news, isn't it? I mean, we're talking about the real gospel, the real good news. We're not talking about the Disney World good news. <laughs> and guess what? God calls us to stand up against those powers and principalities. Kind of overcome our illusion that we live in so many times that nothing bad's going on in the world. We need to be aware of those things. We need to speak truth and love. We need to offer our voice many times for the voiceless. And you know, Brian came last week and he talked about the women in the world. And he talked about the most impoverished people in the world are women and children. And today we lit an advent candle for the children of the world. That we might remember their suffering. And that they're caught up in their innocence in the midst of a very violent place. But God does not leave us abandoned. God does not remove God's self from us in that place. God comes to be with us in the midst of it to offer us a new way, a better way. I mean, Herod, he's this kind of puppet king of Rome. Um, I'm, that's the best picture I got of Herod. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he's this puppet king of Rome. He's a Jew. Uh, and he is living under that authority, and he's been given power and prestige, even though he has no power and prestige, because the Roman Empire has that. Uh, he's so evil and despicable that he even killed his two sons because he felt threatened by them. And he was a dark, 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 self-centered, narcissistic man. He is a good image for us of a dictator or an evil ruler or the embodiment of a system that is corrupt. And so we find ourselves around Herod. And it didn't just happen in Herod's day. You know, Israel's been wrestling with this their whole life cycle. Um, Matter of fact, the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament is constantly holding Israel accountable to their brokenness, their darkness, and their own desire for their own prosperity, even over and against their children's lives. I mean, listen to what the prophet says. He says, they set up their abominations in the house that bears my name and defiled it. They built the high places of Baal and the valley of the son of Hinnom to offer up their sons and daughters to Moloch. Though it, I did not command them, nor did I enter my mind that they should do this abomination, causing Judah to sin. And what was happening in that day was is that the children of Israel, because they wanted their lives to be successful, were being influenced by outside forces, by other religious traditions. And one of those traditions was they worshipped Moloch, this big bull god, and they would offer their children as a sacrifice, and they would light a fire, and their children would be consumed in the fire. And the children of Israel, the very children God called out and set free from the hand of Pharaoh, find themselves turning in that direction because they want greater prosperity for their lives, and they forget their God. They're even willing to sacrifice their children at the altar, to give their children up. And Jeremiah's saying, what is with this? This is not what our God desires. God never asked you to do this. Why are you participating in this way? Why or how are you able to possibly surrender your children to such darkness? How can anyone do this to their children? I don't know. 
And I can't say I'm completely innocent. I'm caught up and bound by the systems of this world, too. I participate in a lot of ways. I oftentimes buy clothing, probably, that's been made by children in sweatshops. I have oftentimes supported things that led to greater violence, or didn't stand up for a brother or sister who might be different than me. We've all done it. Amen? Amen. You know, all over the world, Nations do terrible things to their children. And one of the things they do is we send our children to war. In the United States, the average age is about 19 to 20, but in other countries around the world, the average age is around 10. And I remember the prophet Jeremiah hearkening to Israel, why are you doing this? And if you don't think that is a sacrifice of your children, then you need to wrestle with that. got me thinking. Jesus enters into the midst of the world as a child. He comes in the vulnerability of a child to offer us a better way, a better king, a new life. You see, in the birth narrative, when God enters into the midst of the world and is a gift for the world, it stands in contrast to the systems that are bound by their power and their violence and their desire to consume and to control. This God enters into the midst in humility, in innocence, to bring peace. As a matter of fact, the, the prophet Micah says, he shall be the one of peace. It's not just that he kind of likes peace or that he will represent peace. He is the one who is peace. Everything God is, God calls us to be as well as his church, as his people. You and I have been called to be peacemakers in the midst of the world. You cannot avoid that if you read the scripture. You can't avoid that if you confront the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ because God comes into the midst of the world that the systems of the past may fade away to offer us to be participants in the new creation, to be the new humanity, to be a new covenant relationship with the world, to say, guess what? We no longer need to be bound in the brokenness and the darkness and the violence of the world. We can be free and we can do it differently. When the Barry makes mention of the fact that he says, you know, power has no imagination. Power just dominates. He says, people of faith united in Christ, we're a people who've been born in imagination. We're able to see a hope-filled sign before us. And we're able to live and embody that in the midst of the world. We're, we're to do that difficult work together. And it's all wrapped up in this. To love. To love unconditionally. And to be willing to give ourselves for others in relationship to the world. To let everybody know that this is who our God is. And this is how our God entered in the midst of the world. This is why our God gave God's self for us in Jesus Christ on the cross. And this is what the victory from the grave is all about. It's about life and life abundantly. And not just for you and I who have personally gotten to know Jesus, but is offering life to everyone who will receive it. Amen? Amen? And that's our good work together. And sometimes that calls us to move outside of the world that is broken and dark and, and, and the systems of the world and actually to stand opposed to those things and to call them out. <coughs> so this Sunday, we light a candle for the children. Because we're aware that uh, we live in a broken world, in a dark world. It's given testimony even in the scripture itself. God comes into the midst of it to offer us peace and hope. But I think we need to pray for the children. To pray for the children. And to remember them and their plight. Because I know in Naples, Florida, sometimes I forget. It's a beautiful path. I'm very thankful to be here. But we all forget. And so somebody in the first service said, well, that was really depressing. Sorry. And I said, you know, I'm not going to apologize. Because we're still in season that. And I think we need to remember. And so I got to thinking to myself, how many children, how many children in the world are affected by the systems that are corrupt? Bible. 
there are approximately 1.6 million homeless children in the United States. And there are over 100 million homeless children in the world. There are over 153 million orphans in the world. 7.6 million children die of hunger or disease every year. That's 21,000 children a day. That's one child every four seconds. Children are being trafficked all over the world. 1.2 million children. And that includes uh, child labor and also sex trafficking uh, and other forms of basically kidnapping children. After World War II, 4.5 million children have been disabled by war, and 2 million children have been killed in war. And initially they thought after World War II that the death toll for children would actually go down, but it actually increased because the weapons of war affect more people. The bombs are bigger. They kill more people in larger areas. 300,000 children are soldiers in the world. My brothers and sisters, this is the end of the gospel story that I left for this moment. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was in fury raid and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. On this third Sunday of Advent, we lament the children of the world. And we join our, our hearts and our lives with Rachel's weeping. But we weep not out of self-pity or feeling like we're lost or not able to accomplish anything. We weep because we weep in hope, knowing that we are people of faith and a God who came to be with us in the midst of it all and showed us how to live and how to offer ourselves in the midst of it all. Jesus Christ is the good news, even in the midst of a world full of terror. And you and I, we are good news in the midst of a world full of terrorists. We as a people stand in opposition, in contrast to those systems. And we have to hold ourselves accountable to that as well and seek to live our lives differently. And maybe even seek to, to teach and to train and to raise up our children differently. That we may all have the mind of Christ celebrate good news. You know what's interesting to me about all those statistics about the children? Is that every single aspect of, of abuse and violence and things that children experience can be preventable. I'm aware people die all the time. The children die in the midst of the world. But every single instance that we saw on the screen today is preventable. You shall be the one of peace of course, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Jesus reminds us that blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son.